Good afternoon. So I hope uh, most of you were here this morning. Yes? Yes. So I don't, I don't have to do it again. You've seen it. Great. So uh, this morning it was more about um, the, um, the big picture, the general perspective. Uh, this afternoon I've been asked to focus uh, more in, well, Christian, you're, you're a kind guy. You're telling us all catastrophic numbers. Um, you know, making painting everything in, in black. So how do we now make this happen? So is it possible to do it actually? Because what we are talking about is in gentlemen is no less than risk killing, you know, 10% of the workforce any given year going forward. Hmm. So the, the first thing maybe would be to understand what we are talking about. And so let's, uh, and I don't know on the technical side, if they are ready with my presentation, that would be a good idea. And that's perfectly on time. Thank you very much. Um, and so basically, this is what I, uh, I was announcing this morning. It's not a fantasy. I mean, all those forks are known to be pretty serious. You know, uh, the GT Morgans, the EU Commission, the Amazons, the AT&T. So if they, if they are announcing such big investments, it's just because, you know, um, again, they are not philanthropists. They understand it's, uh, it's not a national threat uh, crisis. It's kind of a company crisis. They just have to do it. There is no choice. Either they don't find a resource or the people cannot cope anymore with the technology they are putting into place, uh, or both at the same time, et cetera, et cetera. So I am not going to remake uh, this morning pitch. So basically the first thing uh, a lot of people are asking me is, Christian, is this worthwhile? So, so basically um, you're telling us, is it really worth uh, to put so much money on the table? Um, so what we did here, and as an example, I'm not going to go into details, was an example about um, how much is it at stake for uh, an employer to f make someone redundant um, because he's not uh, suitable anymore for the position, and then to try to find someone else. So maybe there will be an opportunity cost in the middle because basically the position will be vacant, I need to take temp to fill. Um, then maybe I will occur some cost to recruit. It will take a few months to onboard. Um, the person, although I hired her or him, uh, are going to be waiting for a few months. I just hired a senior manager uh, the last week. Uh, she has a, a period to wait until the joining, in, until July 1st. So, you know, I'm happy I found someone, but I, I'm going to wait six months. So this is costing money because at that time, I, I just can't do business. So there is an opportunity cost. So it just costs money. At the same time, the state, because the state at the same time is having a, a, a something, because the guy or the lady you made redundant, uh, basically as a state, I'm going to take care of him or her at an employment office. Uh, maybe I'm going to pay for some training. By the way, there is no salary anymore, so there is no tax. There is no social security collected. So basically, I also have some uh, money I'm, I'm losing. So we did some real analysis in many different uh, environments and countries. And what I can tell you is that for any euro, any euro or Swiss franc, a company would put in upskilling, uh, both the company and the state are making at least one euro in addition. So there is kind of a 200% um, profit on the top of one Swiss franc you put on the table. So we think it's, it's worthwhile. And basically, when we start computing those figures with governments, with cities, or with corporates, well, then they basically understand, well, th there is a case. Because again, you know, if you are the CHRO of a firm, and I meet many of them, and I can tell you a very a, a true story. I was meeting with the CHRO of an automotive company, um, half a million workers, and she was telling me, Christian, and I was explaining you this morning how fast automotive industry is moving, is moving and she, she was telling me, you know, at the speed it goes, I need to upskill at least 50,000 people every single year. Let, let's say, you know, I only not pay 24,000, like I explained this morning, but only 10,000. I leave you to compute in your mind 10,000 by 50,000. You got it? So this is just for the first year. But she told me I have to compute that for the next five years. And then I need to cross that door at the end of the corridor go to my TO office and ask for a five billion budget. The problem is not that I need to go there and ask because there is a business case. I just don't know how to do it. Because trying to upskill, to retrain people at such a scale, spending so much money, there will be no mercy. You have to be efficient. 
it has to work. As a CEO, if I put five billion on the table, and actually that's what they do. You've just seen the figures. Well, we are, as an HR community, looked at by, hey, how can you can show me that uh, basically the money I put on the table, I uh, will get my one euro, my two euro Swiss franc as a return. So this is about what I'm gonna show you now in a minute. And basically these are the topics, uh, again, which are uh, induced by, by this. And it's really about the change in the regulatory. I mean, I'm not going to do the pitch again, but you, you see here all the, the effects which are basically pushing any given company these days, uh, being in the retail, uh, being in the wood industry, in the maritime business, in the tourism business, um, in car business, in the aerospace business, in any business basically, to retrain or upskill their people. So, I promise you something is to define what you are talking about. Because I think uh, we've been talking a little bit about upskilling uh, this morning. You heard the word quite a bit, but what are we talking about? So basically, I, I tried to make very clear and very simple. Every individual in companies normally gets a few days training a year, okay? If you work in a company, do you get a few days training a year? Usually, yeah, three, four, five, six days training a year, normal? No, yes, kind of, okay. Well, in the US it's much less. Um, statistics are showing it's, uh, it's less than two days. In Europe it's three to five days. When you dig into details, and there are some people uh, and hopefully doing research on this, you can discover that 80% on this kind of ongoing training is dedicated to learning to do better what we already know. It's basically going from Excel to Excel Advanced to uh, basic English to advanced English, whatever, okay? So only 20% of the ongoing training we get on a yearly basis is dedicated to totally new things. So if you compute three days and you take 20%, it makes a half a day. So basically, as corporates, on an average, and again, there are exceptions, and I'm sure exceptions are in this room, but on an average, we are dedicating half a day of training to get our employees to learn something new. Well, that might have worked in the last century or millennium, where technology were evolving extremely slowly, but these days, what you are doing in the technology space, this is totally impossible. So we have to change the rule of the game. The rule of the game, it's not the horizontal bar that you see on the top, which is basically those three, four, five days we give to everybody. And, and you see this is covering the 100% when we do of the population. We are looking at the horizontal, the vertical bar. The vertical bar is only aiming at five to 10% of people, which are the ones which are triggered by transformation any year in any company. If you are not transforming a lot, it's going to be 5%. If you are retransforming a lot, it could go up to 15, 20%. But the average is between 5 to 10% of your workers will be triggered by transformation every given year. So for those ones, we don't need to give two, three days. We need to give 20, 25, 30 days. We need to embark them in the training we just heard of for, for a week. And in addition, we need to get soft skills. You heard this morning the 40, 40, 20 rule I gave you about 40% soft skills, 40% technical skills, 20% digital skills. So basically we need to run a program for those guys so they are up to speed for another five to six years. Okay? So if I need, again, to give a definition, it's really to give a new set of qualification uh, to someone uh, and it takes uh, what you add on, on the screen. I'm not, I'm not going to read what you can read. So, the thing again is, how do we do this? So, that has been kind of a painful and long process, to be honest. When we embarked on this journey a few years ago, um, we were given the challenge to do this at the nation level. And, um, and basically, you know, uh, it's, it's a fascinating topic because you are discovering new fields. You know, you feel a little bit like Columbus and you, you, you tried, you go on sea and you don't know where it's going to be Earth, you know? And, and basically that's what we did. And um, we've been doing co-design, design thinking with, uh, with CEOs, with CHROs, with trainers, with employees, with federation of employers. Um, we've been going to uh, test banks uh, to test the, the process. And at the end, this is that kind of logical process which comes out of it. And basically in HR, and I was an HR director for more than 20 years, so I can, you know, beat myself, we are kind of usually used to verticalize things. So we have people that are doing the admin, we have people doing the recruitment, we have people doing the training, we have people doing the payroll. 
Well, we hardly connect those guys between each other. It's kind of usually vertical uh, management. What we discovered is that basically if we want to get this to run, we need to horizontalize it. We need to recreate a flow between the strategy and the individual execution. Well, mixing, honestly, company strategy with Christian training is kind of a challenge. So basically, this is what the story I'm going to tell you now and the, the process we define to get there. Yeah, that's the, the thing about leading strength. Um, so let's take something very classical. Uh, and I take um, a company, which is Tech Factoring. And um, I've got this guy, John, uh, who is industry managing mechanics, works at this company in the projection facility. And he sees his job threatened by the new technology. Uh, and he only has experience in mechanics. So basically, how do I do? Well, this is one out of one million examples we could have taken. But uh, so we have something very concrete. So basically, uh, when you are uh, looking at such, a, at such an endeavor, uh, as companies, um, most of my clients, most of the things I see both at corporate and um, governmental level, being cities or whatever, they have two ideas, which are kind of logical because it is what people are kind of uh, able to take a grip on, and that's what they know. The first thing, they, they, they talk about perspective, and the second thing, they talk about training. And most of them, honestly, they talk about training first, which is interesting, but idiotic. Because basically, the training is coming at the end of the process. And we see now a lot of initiatives which are about to throw big trainings all around. But to whom are we going to this training, for which purpose, and for which job? Because if we don't answer those questions, the return on investment on training will be most likely very, very low. OK? So basically, the first thing we, we are doing with, uh, with people is to really understand the context. Where do we stand? Am I in uh, the canton of Vaux? So who are the stakeholders here? Who is deciding? Who has the money, by the way? Who is, well, what's the governance of this? Uh, if I need to upskill people, who is going to decide about that? By the way, if someone is not playing the game, what are the sanctions? Um, how do we define communication, change management? Who's dealing with that? Is that necessary? By the way, is the workers' organization being to, going to be involved in that? Or is it something useless? Is the, maybe an employment agency going to play a role? So you see all those questions. If you are a corporate, you can think exactly the same, because you're going to have exactly the same kind of stakeholders to, to, to look at, and exactly the same architecture somewhere questions to be raised. And if you don't solve this before starting your journey, I shall tell you, your journey will be stopped because basically you're going to have to answer the questions in the journey. There is no question. So the first thing we do is read about that. And by the way, we are also, and one should build his business case also financially, because nobody like the AT&T of the world, which were on the pitch before that you could see, will decide to push the button for one billion without knowing the return on investment. So you're going to have to spend a little bit of time in the CFO office, for sure, okay, before going to the CEO or to the board. Okay? Certainly to have such amount. So this is the preparatory work. And again, I know usually people like action, but this is action uh, to, be, to, make, to make sure that when you get into it, you're not going to be stopped. And uh, we quite underestimate it. The second thing is to understand what's going to be the work of the future. And well, the work of the future, honestly, this is also something very uh, interesting. Here, we could see that um, we have basically um, two tendencies. You got looking very long in the future, five years, 10 years. And when I was a, a, a young HR director, sorry for that, guys, um, uh, we used to do workforce planning five years down the road. OK, that was normal in the 90s and in the early 2000s. Nowadays, most of the people I'm meeting with they are doing workforce planning in one year, 18 months max. In the US, it's even nine months, six months, because it's running so fast, business-wise and technology-wise. So basically, we can have certainty about position evolution, position evolution, usually one year down the road. So the exercise we do with uh, one might be willing to do is to figure out what's going to be the future of my position one year down the road. And I can tell you it's feasible. We do, we, we've done it in many, many different uh, environments, even at scale. Even at scale, because technology now is enabling that. And I won't go in details because I see the time running, but uh, basically, um, this is really something you could be doing uh, very easily. 
The thing is, once you are there, you have a piece of information which is absolutely critical. You have, have three informations, which are the jobs that are going to be remaining the same, the 90% I was talking this morning, which are the jobs that are going to be augmented. So basically, my seat is there, it's going to be staying there. But if I want still to be sitting on that stair, I need to kind of, you know, go on my tools and upskill myself. This is what we call augmentation, okay, augmented job. And we're going to have jobs that are going to be just cancelled. And of course, in front of those jobs, we're going to have the new jobs due to retirement, rotation, but also creation of new jobs. So this is the outcome of what you have here. The thing and thing is, uh, of course, when you have been doing this, and you should be doing this basically in kind of two months, regardless of the size of your organizations, which sometimes is challenging, you need to understand what a person is able to do. Say, you know, I'm, I'm in that job. I'm going to be augmented. So basically, if the HR director is looking to me, he should be asking the question, Chris, you know, are we willing to take one of those? Oh, shit. You know, the, the, all those jobs are available because I'm a big company. So, okay, so which job is suited for you? Well, the only way to answer this is to be able to understand what I can do. We agree with that? The problem is, in most of the RHR system, being the success factor of the workday, the Oracle, that information is not there. Because basically, we have some evaluation. We have a CV, usually, which is 15 years down the road. Um, and some information, because usually, employees are not trusting employer that much. So they, dis they disclose as less as they can. You don't recognize anything here. Um, so basically, what we do, we are advising to run a soft skills test just to understand on the soft size who we are. Why? Because we also seen earlier that soft skills are playing a critical role in a new position these days. It was already the case before. It's even more the case tomorrow. Hard skills, which are the more technical skills, are also surveyed. Okay? And so basically, when you have both of them, and you can do that online, and it takes usually less than an hour per individual, you have a picture of what Christian is able to do. Then, then honestly, we are almost there. Because if you have the step two, which, is, which are all those jobs available tomorrow, and we understand all of us here in the room, what we are able to do, there is an interesting exercise to do, and maybe you may have a look around yourself here. Just, just turn your heads and look at this room, please, for one second, just to get a feeling about all those empty seats and all the people in the room. So now try to understand who could sit on which seat in an organization of this size. Well, if we would have the exercise with an organization of this size, which honestly is a small one, I can tell you the complexity of allocating us to the right seat would be already absolutely insane. I'll leave you to organize this for a company of 10,000 people, of 50,000 people, of 100,000 people. So the only way to do that is technology. So basically the next step, uh, when we have this information about which are the job of tomorrow and which are the people, and these are an idea of the the, the, the matching is really to match people to the job. And AI, what you're doing, is helping to do that. There are some tools nowadays, some tools. The, the plural here is a bit uh, optimistic. There are only a very few tools who are able to do this. A lot are claiming to do it. Not so many are able to do it because a lot of tools have BAs or are not being taught the right way. I know I'm speaking to specialists, so you know what I mean. Um, and so basically the idea here is to kind of look uh, this guy sitting there, being myself, which are the job here, which might suit my skills. Of course, there is an intermediate step, which is also to understand my motivation. So there needs to be a conversation, of course, with me, with a human. The machine will not do everything. And then, and then only, and then only we come to training. And you see that the, the, the journey to go to training is a long one. Huh? Then only we come to training. And even there, we have difficulties. Because what we also realized is that for HR departments, creating curriculum which are really aligned with Christian, which is sitting on chair number two there, is extremely complicated. Because we are used to do bulk training. We are pushing sessions with 30 people, with 200 people. We are not used to run sessions with Christian requirements. So basically what also technology enables to do today is really to take Christian's track which has been designed, and we can also do that using AI, which is kind of bridging the skills gap and the training required to bridge the skills gap. 
And then if you have a thousands of Christians, then you massify on the top. Because basically then you can still organize mass training, but having individual tracks. I hope you've been following this one. So basically what we are looking here is a fundamental shift in the way we organize things. Yesterday or today still, we are doing training, usually in bulk for populations, regardless of their wishes or about their skills. In this case, we are only pushing the button of the investment when I'm sure, sure, that Christian can do the job based on an assessment, that he's willing to take the job, and basically I will, promise, prom I will tell him, Chris, this is your job if you are doing the training. So you can imagine the motivation of this guy uh, to run the training, because he knows that at the end of the journey there is a secure job. So the ROI on training is usually rocketing. That's the idea. So, again, you might believe <laughs> this, is, this is fantasy. Um, this is no fantasy. This is, uh, I was talking this morning about Singapore doing something like this. Well, this is exactly what it is. Uh, if you would be looking at the uh, RFP that just come, came out from Costa Rica at a country level, this is exactly what they describe, almost at the comma, you know, really at the most detail, this is exactly what they come from with. Um, there are many organizations and countries these days which are going into that direction, which are really willing people to understand which are the jobs, to allocate the jobs, to really look at the skills gap, to really kind of go for the training only when the job is secured, because they have found exactly the work we did, and it's no surprise that uh, many people come to the same conclusion at the same time, it's always the, the, the same thing. Um, they have understood that if we want to massify training, but at the same time individualized track, this is the only way to go and that technology can really help us. So, of course, the end of the game is to, uh, to maybe come back to research, but also at company level to look at what's the outcome of this. Uh, what we are asking people to do also is to rate training, is to give an opinion about the efficiency, is to look at the resilience of people on the job after the training, so we can really monitor efficiency of what's happening. And so basically then we can close the loop and we can have a, a, I mean, a, a loop which is enabling us to be even more efficient in the future. So, in a nutshell, this is how uh, basically we see uh, upskilling in practice. Thank you very much.